Where did nutritional ketosis come from? And why did we have to define that as a term? Over a century ago, doctors figured out that when people with what, what's called type 1 diabetes, the diabetes typically of younger folks where the pancreas stops making any insulin at all, they uh, aren't, can't use glucose at all for fuel and the body overproduces ketones. The ketones build up to very high levels and that's called ketoacidosis. So when ketones build up to very high levels, you can actually smell them on a person. It's like a smell this, the, these ketones and say, ah, you know, this is a, uh, uncontrolled diabetes. And they realize that that changes the acid levels in the blood and that's ketoacidosis. But these are vastly elevated levels of ketones. So figure, let's say a number of 20. Um, would be an extremely high level of ketones. But if you're eating a well-formulated ketogenic diet, your blood levels are not 20. Your blood levels will be in the range of 0.5 to 3. So it's one-tenth that very high level. Um, and yet, if you eat, say, orange juice and bagel for breakfast, uh, after breakfast your ketone levels will not be 0.5 to 3. They'll be 0.1 or 0.2. So one-tenth. 10 times higher is nutritional ketosis, 10 times higher than that is ketoacidosis. Um, and so we define this state of nutritional ketosis as being a safe blood level where ketones function to feed vital organs in the body when you're not eating a whole lot of carbohydrate. You can see in the green zone between 0.5 and 3 or 4, that's what we call the optimum ketone zone. That's where ketones have beneficial effects in terms of feeding the brain and other organs in the body. And as you can see, if you're in total starvation, which we don't recommend uh, because of negative effects on lean tissue and, and organ function, total starvation ketones will go up as high as seven. And you don't get anywhere near the risk of ketoacidosis till the numbers are above 10. These are very distinct states differentiating nutritional ketosis from diabetic ketoacidosis. The reason we know that this is, it's not a rumor or word of mouth, there are some very solid scientific papers in the medical literature now indicating not just that, gee, looks like inflammation goes down. We actually know precisely how the beta-hydroxybutyrate, this primary ketone we have in our blood, makes in inflammation and oxidative stress uh, go down and provides optimized control for some inflammatory diseases. Let's kind of get to a little bit more practical information. How does one get into nutritional ketosis? People who have reason to want to have benefit, if they have type 2 diabetes or they're severely overweight or have hypertension, very often those people have what we call insulin resistance. That is, their body has begun to lose its responsiveness to this hormone insulin, which is the hormone that, that causes blood sugar to go into cells and also manages body fat metabolism. So if you're insulin resistant, you probably have to get your daily total carbohydrate intake down somewhere between 20 and 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. If you want to think about that in terms of macronutrients, that's less than 10% and oftentimes less than 5% of your total daily energy intake comes from carbs. And so that's very carb restricted. And the more insulin resistant the person is, the lower they have to go to initially uh, get into a state of nutritional ketosis. And then the other key point of a well-formulated ketogenic diet is this is not a calorie-restricted stop eating when you eat X number of calories per day. This is a diet, when it's done right, is eaten to satiety. That is, when you finish a meal, you should be satiated and you shouldn't be hungry till it's time for your next meal. And the way you do that, if you're eating very little carbohydrate and moderate protein, is the majority of your dietary calories have to come from fat. And we'll come back to the safety issues around, is it okay to eat that much fat if it's more than half my calories? Uh, and the answer is yes.